Welcome back to Are You a Robot? This is a series where we aim to tackle some of the most challenging and interesting questions that stem from AI and related technologies. The way that we're doing that is by getting the best and the brightest minds in their respective fields to come on here and talk with me about how they see the state of things, what they're looking at at the world through, what lenses they're looking at the world through, I should say, and where there are problematic areas where they feel there needs to be attention, time, and care put into things. So the conversations don't stop here. If you like this episode content, I encourage you jump into our Slack community. We've got the links for that down below. Feel free to introduce yourself. Let us know what you're working on, how you feel about some of these themes and issues that are coming up. Next, I will say that Ethics Grade is our sponsor. They've been our sponsor from the very beginning. Those of you that have been listening know they are incredible. They're an ESG ratings company. So what that means is they measure the non-financial impact of companies. And they specifically have a focus on the AI ethics of different companies. So I encourage you, if you would like to know what the AI ethics policies and ratings of these large tech companies that we tend to talk about quite a bit on this show, go check out Ethics Grade and see their different ratings that they've given to companies like Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Amazon, you name it. They're on there. And without further ado, let us talk with Nicola. Are you a robot? Excellent. It is a pleasure to finally be able to talk with you, Nicola. I'm excited to talk about all things science fiction today and how your decisions and what you're doing in your current job can be motivated or are influenced by science fiction. I find it fascinating as a, a person who absolutely loves to get lost in what the future holds. So it's going to be exciting to talk to you about these kind of things. It might be useful for the listeners out there if we can just get a little bit of your story and how you got to be where you're at. Okay, so I, I was born in France and I have a twin brother. And um, part of my life is about competing with my twin brother and cooperating with him. And um, as part of the competition, it became very clear when I was a teenager that I wanted to do something very different from him. And he studied economics. I said, I want to write. It was hard to become a journalist. You know, my parents were a bit like, ah, journalism. So I thought, ah, you know, why not law? I mean, lawyers write well. And I got into that. I loved politics at the time. And, and then that drove me a little bit, you know, in, in various areas of Europe. And um, I ended up working in Bel studying and working in Belgium, uh, doing European Union kind of stuff and, uh, and uh, studying law and economics, innovation. I mean, it's a long process, but eventually I, I ended up spending, you know, a lot of time looking at technology, innovation and law and... Um, hence my interest for science fiction. This is actually one area in which my twin brother and myself have a, very, a lot of common ground. So we, we share books and um, so competition and, and cooperation. Excellent. Can you break down for us what exactly you're doing these days at, for your job, like your day-to-day? -day, what does that entail? Right. So... Um, the European University Institute where I work is uh, located in Florence, Italy, and um, it is essentially um, a postgraduate institute where we train PhD researchers in law, economics, history, and political science. And so my job is to select, train, and help 
PhD students in law to go for, from day one of their PhD experience to the VIVO, which is the, the day where they defend the dissertation for um, an audience of experts and the public audience. And so that's what I do. I, I, I train and, and help them throughout their, their time in the PhD program. Perfect. Now, I believe that I, I read somewhere that you're, you're also a member of a high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. Is that correct? Yeah, so I was. Uh, the group has been discontinued a few months ago, but I've, I've been spending quite a lot of time in Brussels helping this group. So we were 52, and they called us experts. Uh, there were people from academia, industry, government, uh, people interested in the law and regulation of artificial intelligence systems. And we had multiple meetings trying to produce um, papers that would uh, frame and give directions to decision makers on how to deal with these systems in ways which are ethical and lawful. So what are some of these main challenges that you saw when you're trying to attack a problem like that? Right. So I think the main and, and the first challenge really is to, is to understand uh, the technological capabilities of the issues, systems, devices that you're talking about. It's very unclear what AI systems will be able to do, when. And so there's, there's all this uncertainty about what the technology can do and cannot do and when it can do and when it cannot do. So that's really the big, big, big issue because you might just end up adopting regulation on things which will never happen. And also you might just not adopt regulation on things which will happen and be very harmful. So it's really hard to face this informational uncertainty. And I imagine sci-fi doesn't help play into that at all because it's so easy to get lost in a narrative of a sci-fi book or a great series. And we think that technology is much more advanced than it actually is, or it is capable of doing these things, or one day it will be capable of doing some of these things, when in reality, it's a lot further off and it's very hard to say whether or not we can have something. I think instantly about Westworld and whether or not we're going to be able to create a world where the real humans are indistinguishable from the machine humans. So how does things like that, like the sci-fi books that you love, how, how do you have, is there a love-hate relationship there for that? That's a, that's a great question. So does sci-fi help um, practitioners of public policy uh, I think my way to think about that is some sci-fi can help or some components of sci-fi can help and some sci-fi and some components of sci-fi can be really counterproductive. And I'm actually trying to write a paper about that, which is how do you discriminate within the set of facts of fiction that SF has to provide between the, the good that can inform policymaking and the bad that should not inform policymaking. And so if you take, we can talk about that more, I'm sure, but if you, if you take writers like Isaac Asimov, for instance, who is himself a scientist, he had a PhD in, in biology, in biochemistry. Um, it's pretty intense in, in terms of the scientific content. Uh, not of course a lot of some of many of his works had not much uh, claim to to be scientific, but he was interested in science. You can read that in in most of his works. 
whereas other types of works have no connection to science at all. So if you think about um, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, Ubik, for instance, it's 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 the, the 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 fiction does not really work on science. It works on on very fictional and weird and crazy ideas about what you know humans and and weird humans with psychological capabilities can do. So I'm writing this paper. I'm, I'm you know the paper is still in the works, but um. I hope to to gain a better understanding of how to draw the line between the helpful SF and the unhelpful SF in policy environments. Yeah, it feels like that is a very slippery slope to advocate for one without advocating for them all. And you say, well, this one is based enough in science that there's a plausible reality where it could or pieces of this could come true. And this one has no basis in reality. It's got a 0% chance that any of it is going to come true. I guess you could look at it as like a spectrum. Like this one has more of a percent chance that some of the the key factors or some of the storylines or whatever you choose to take from it could be realized in a distant future or in one of the universes that may come about. But then this one has a much less confidence that anything is going to actually be realized. That being said, though, there may be a lot of science fiction that isn't necessarily based in science, but it could be properly predicting what comes next for us humans. Do you not agree? Yeah, so I, I completely agree with that. That's, um, that's a very, very nice and deep insight that you're, you're phrasing here. And so f- pure fiction, not necessarily science fiction, allows us to think about social responses to facts which might be invented or which might be a real empirical facts and sci-fi even when it runs on very low scientific content can provide us hints as to as to how people respond to uh in new scenarios even scenarios which have no sci- and that is that can be helpful in itself so i think what's interesting in in science fiction is that you have two sets of of facts on which policymakers can rely to to make scenarios about the future, you have the technological facts, which are the facts about technology, and that they should be, in as much as possible, based on serious science. Otherwise, you can just uh, leave the story aside. And then you have the social facts in science fiction, which is how the people react to technological change. And these are these are fairly um, um, these are fairly well established, in a sense, uh, laws of of um, of nature. Um, so, if you look at Asimov again, so Asimov, his works. If you if you look at his works in in a very in a very broad way, in a very high level way, what you see is Asimov says that. Societies never accept technological change as such. They always want to regulate. They always, they always adapt to technological evolution with some fear. So there's always some demand for control of technology. But at the same time, Asimov's work say that societies never, no society, no recent society has ever completely discarded technology. Right? There's very few instances in which we would say, oh, we don't want the technology or the science. Right? These are very rare instances. So Asimov contemplates a social response to technological evolution, which is control, but not anni- annihilation. And this is a helpful, you know, this is a helpful scenario. In the, and, and I think it's a scenario that uh, tracks the 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 reality of the world we live in. Hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating idea, especially the idea around technology 
and society and how sci-fi can play to both of these and how when you or policymakers are thinking about the future and thinking about how certain technologies are going to affect us in the future, we need to have very concrete feet on the ground rooted in scientific actual reality with respect to what the tech technology is capable of at this moment and potentially in the next five years, what we are predicting it is capable of, or maybe five years is too long, maybe just a year, because the longer out that we project, the more difficult it becomes to actually realize that, right? And so you have that side, which needs to be based very much in science and reality and the current state of affairs. And then you have the other side, which is a much more of a, a soft science, we could say. And that feels like we could take a lot more cues from other writers and philosophers and also history. Uh, like you mentioned, it's something that we've seen it time and time again because where we are right now, it's not the first piece of technology that's being introduced into our society, right? So we can look at history and see how society has adapted or fought against different technological advances. I, I find that a fascinating insight on how policymakers can effectively weigh the pros and cons of making these different policies or trying to look ahead into the future. The... Next thing that I, I wanted to ask you is since you spend so much time and you really enjoy looking at all of these different ways or the, yeah, the different ways that the future could play out, is there some that for you are, are more particularly interesting in if we as a society go in a certain direction? So your, your question is on specific types of technological directions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, I think there's, there's a difference between my personal vibe for certain types of sci-fi stories and my intellectual and professional um, perspective on on which of these ones really matter. And so I'm really drawn into stories, into space opera type of stories these days. And it really has nothing to do with the Elon Musk type, um, you know, investments into SpaceX and, and, um, and, uh, the rover on Mars and, and all that. It, I mean, it's, you know, I, it goes way back. And I was, I was reading foundations like, you know, when I was a kid, I reread that the books of Asimov Foundation on it's, it's a big space opera, you know, a long time ago. I'm actually not a big fan of Star Wars, uh, unlike a lot of people. So, but, you know, I've been a long time fan of foundation and, but anyway, so this is my personal stuff. Um, as a social scientist, um, my, my area of immediate concern with technology is um, about information, what's true and what's not true. And so there, there's that. And um, the the problems that so it's not I'm not thinking here specifically about fake news or disinformation even though these are the subjects that are of deep, deep concern to me but uh, we produce more information meaning data about ourselves and about our souls than probably ever in history or actually we don't produce more we just have access to much more and um, 
the widespread availability of that information makes it very hard for us to make sense of, to make sense of the world. So even people who have a very strong educational background, so who have had the, the luck and the economic uh, opportunities to study at university and reason about the world in you know ways which which are rational and interested in in the truth even people with a strong educational baggage struggle to make sense of the gigantic amount of information that we that we face and this is i mean this is really this is a big problem uh, you have to think about it because we are all in the same in a way this is the big equalizer because you know people people who went to Harvard University and people who could not uh, go to Harvard University will face the same influx of information with complete inability to make sense of the world, distinguish what's true, what's not true, order, but you know, more importantly, order the information, understand consistency or inconsistency, um, distinguish between first you know, first order priorities, second order priorities, distinguish anecdote from sy system or pattern. And so this creates a society in which we can all reconstruct our own reality and our own identity because there's no, there's no grid, there's no template, there's no structure. And, and, you know, if you live in a world in which you have billions of people with, where everyone has, is our own independent mindset about the world, it creates a lot of complexity to organize the world in a way which is peaceful and prosperous, right? You need cooperation, as I was saying before, you need cooperation between people to, to run a functional society. And if, you know, we are, we are all sort of, we've all sort of come up with our, with our individualized understanding of the reality and of our identity, we end up creating a lot of transaction costs to creating a society that works. And so I'm a bit concerned about that. I mean, it's deeply philosophical, and I hope I'm not drawing your listeners to some very abstract um, um, intuitions or conclusions, but this is my current problem in my professional practice is this idea about the, the widespread ubiquity of disordered information and how we can treat that and build a society that works out of that. Well, you speak about how difficult it is to have a society that is harmonious when you have that kind of situation. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, so... Um, our political systems are essentially systems that aggregate preferences of groups, communities, or certain types of units of people who feel that there is, um, they share a common ground. And this can be done top down by very uh, st strong, you know, leaders, you know, that can be autocracy to some extent or, or even worse, or this can emerge bottom up. Uh, by virtue of you know more lo local communities and then spread and, and become bigger. But anyway, you know I think political systems and governance systems are can be defined as systems which aggregate preferences and in which these preferences then compete against each other and and periodically uh, um, replace each other. Right? This is the way societies work. And, and you know, I don't think there's anything actually inherently and, and, and singularly human in that we know that some other species also work on these types of, you know, group think and, and, and collaboration. And so I'm just, you know, curious and intrigued by this, um, this, this, this world where we are increasingly thinking about the self or developing a very conscious understanding of our self and what the impact will be 
on this ability of societies to work on the basis of aggregated preferences. And we are already seeing the units of analysis change in terms of what's relevant in society. I mean, so we have a lot of discussions about, you know, people, some people who like certain food more than others. And they, so there's a lot of opportunity for more collaboration, but the units of these collaborations between groups change completely from what we had in the past, where, for instance, you know, you can think about for centuries ago, Churches were the aggregator of preferences. You had the Christian church, um, you had uh, Islam, you had um, Hinduism, and, you know, they were aggregators of preferences. Then you had, and, you know, they competed with the states and others. Now we are seeing, I think, a recomposition of that. And it's not, so, you know, some people, some friends of mine, they say, oh, but, you know, the new churches are the big platforms in the technology environment. So you're a Facebook user, you're part of the Facebook church, and you're an Apple user, you're part of the Apple church. But I don't, I think that's, it's funny, but it's not, it's not really what we are, what we're seeing. What we're seeing is, we're seeing a recomposition of society across um, other types of units. And, and it's not clear what the equilibrium will be in the long term. That's really fascinating to think about and how it's changing. I see, I understand what you're talking about there is how we're looking at the self more and we are trying to grapple with all of this information that is coming at us in every moment and how we decide whether or not to work together or to work on an individual basis is a really interesting topic to dive into and and think about. I'm wondering about the, going back to science fiction, do you feel like it is a useful thought exercise to read science fiction because it gives us different possible realities. It show it gives a, it peeks into the mind of the writer or their imagination, and it can help us open up to what is a potential reality. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great insight. Again, um, so. We reading science fiction allows us to develop our thinking about imaginary cases, imaginary scenarios, about technology, but also about about social responses to technology. And so that helps us learn new things about us. It helps us learn new things about extreme situations that we might not face today, but how we would operate under entirely different situations and the type of reactions we would have. So there's a lot of learning trying to simulate or running science fiction. Let me rephrase that. Science fiction gives us a, an infinite amount of thought experiments on how societies would react in non-ordinary environments. Exactly. It's like we get to envision a simulation of what, or we get to simulate what is possible in our minds. And yeah, and all right, I'm so, sorry to interrupt. So, but so one thing that jumped to mind at the moment is we're actually already doing that in a way when we, when social scientists are studying how people behave in in video games, right? Which are in real worlds where the constraints of physicality do not exist. So, you know, you can die multiple times and you can buy a new life or you can, you know, um, behave as a jerk and, you know, not face the same types of social response to that than you would face in, and, you know, you can be very different from what you are in the real world. So social scientists already try to understand how people react when they're placed in environments where the constraints of, of the physical world do not exist, like in video games. And I think 
sci-fi gives us the same amount of potential in a way. You don't have the clinical observation of how people behave, but you know it's it's a spiritual and mental process which has um, which has a lot of a lot to offer. So, what about this idea that we have not the slightest thought of what is coming because we are not open to that possibility yet. We just see with our limited perspective. I think about a story I heard, I can't remember exactly where, but the idea is if you ask somebody a hundred years ago, what would be a great future, what technology would enable them to do, it's like they think about horses and the plow and they think in the terms that they're living their life in, right? And there's no way that they can ever imagine that, oh, we're going to, you're going to be able to call someone on the other side of the world and record it. And you also see that person in the moment. And then other people are going to listen to it. And we're going to call that thing a video cast. So how can we grapple with that knowledge that we have no idea what's coming in another five years or 10 years or even a hundred years, because there's going to be so many new technologies that open up and bring us into a new state of the world. Yeah, well, so that's a very hard question. Um, a few centuries ago, again, and you know, until today in, in multiple parts of the world, Religion is what helps people face the fear of future uncertainty and the fear of death. It's about, you know, giving people uh, hope beyond death and, um, and hope in the future. And, but, you know, we know also that in many societies today, uh, religion as religious belief, faith, and spiritual um, discipline has receded. And so, you know, so the question is, um, are we today in a situation where societies are more anxious about the future? And, you know, it's possible. I mean, there is a lot of appetite to take control and regulate uh, these days in, in Europe and in the United States. And, you know, that might also have to do with the, um, slow but uh, certain decline in religious belief. Um, so people feel less comfortable about the, when they think about the future, they fear more and they want, they want to take more, a more active uh, role in, in shaping the future, which is, you know, probably um, a good thing. I mean, I'm not saying here that, you know, we should go back to religion and embrace a more spiritual life that's certainly not my suggestion here. I'm just trying to understand what's taking place before our eyes. And, um, and so I think this is probably the response of societies to, to this um, fear of the future and where uh, the technology will, will bring us. As to the trajectories where technology will bring us, which is really what the heart of your question was, I mean, so today we have we're going to have electrical cars. So maybe people think about in a hundred years, we're going to have electrical planes uh -huh. and, um, and electrical, um, I don't know, whatever food. Um, but you know, this would be as you know, in your example about horses, uh, this would be a very, very dangerous prediction to make. So I'm not in, I don't like to make predictions. I, it's safe not to make predictions, but I really don't like to make predictions. And, um, because I, they're often wrong. Um, hmm. just track science. Maybe, you know, we just need to keep tracking science. Science gives us a sense of what's possible, what's impossible. So for instance, one thing that I can tell, and I hope that in a hundred years, this uh, podcast will still be archived somewhere and people can say whether I was right or wrong. But I think in a hundred years, we will not have time travel. Huh. Okay. So I, I think I can tell you that. Um, 
so that's pretty sure. And um, what else? What else could I tell you? I think we won't have, so we won't have time travel and we won't have um, the ability to transport ourselves to a different space in the present mm -hmm. time. Like, you know, um, I don't know how you call this technology, but yeah. Transportation. Yeah, teletransportation. I don't think that will ever happen. <laughs> yeah. The interesting thing to me is the the thought experiment that we're talking about and how we need when we look at what we think the future may be or what others think the future could hold we do not see our blind spots because we're surrounded by them right and it's like the the fish who's swimming in water doesn't realize that they're in water they they're just in the water for us it feels very similar like we don't realize it because it is so innate it is so such a part of what we do we couldn't think that there is another way we have these ideas of teletransport or time uh time travel but maybe there's a whole nother box or side stem of technology that gets opened up in 20 years and it blows our minds that we just like a hundred years ago, they would have never thought that we could be talking to each other halfway across the world with a video. We would have never thought that something else would be a thing. So I, I really enjoy these thought experiments and, and thinking about that. And that's another thing that science fiction is able to open up. What I wanted to jump into now was this law of three, the three laws of robotics. I know you have some interest there. So maybe we could start with that. You could let us know what it is and why you are particularly interested in it. The, the three laws of Asimov are the three laws of robotics. They are instructions which are written in, in every ro robot that um, Asimov talks about. And they are designed as a safety mechanism to avoid catastrophic harms on society. The three laws are very simple. The first law is something like do not harm a human by action or inaction. The second law is obey human instructions ex except when it breaches the first law. And the third law is protect your integrity as a robot, so protect yourself except when this breach is law number two and, and law number one. So there is also a ranking in the laws. And uh, so they are not really phrased this way, but this is the idea. So there's this, you know, idea, do not, do no harm, obey humans, and then, you know, protect yourself. And so it's interesting because this is a common theme in all the, uh, the, the robot, the robot, sorry, the robotic stories of Isaac Asimov, where, and the three laws play a prominent role in most of in most of his science fiction about robots. And so, what got me interested is that I I had read the Asimov books when I was a kid, and when we started discussing AI and robotics in the policy environments, a lot of policymakers and scholars we're going to give talks and the first slide would typically be, oh, you know, the three laws of Asimov. Uh -huh. And and the implication, the message behind it was something like, it was never really explicit, but it was, it was like, you know, Asimov, this famous science fiction writer, when he talks about robots, see, there, there were these laws and, and this shows that we need legislation, we need, we need laws. There's, um, it's inevitable. We have to go there. This is the way to go. And so, I, as a reader in tempore non suspecto of Asimov's work, I, I was often unhappy with this PR 
you know, talking points, because the work of the works of Asimov, of course, they have these laws. But what they what they what Asim the message Asimov is trying to convey is that these laws often fail, and so all the stories are all or most of the stories of robots in Asimov are about how the laws dysfunction. Yes. You know, it's not about we need laws. It's about, you know, you can try to code safety instructions in a robot. It's never going to play out the way you wanted, to, you, you wanted it to play out. And so I think Asimov would like to catch the attention of policymakers not towards replicating the laws or, you know, in, introducing code in the robots, but more into be careful what you do because this is going to create a huge can of problems. And, um, and so we need to think about that. But, you know, I can, I can talk more because he also came up with solutions and, and hints on how to deal with that. Well, it's really what you're talking about is so true. It's not so black and white. And when you put those three laws up there and you think, hey, everything's going to be fine because we've got these three laws, there are so many edge cases, right? That these three laws, they don't cover. And it's almost impossible, if not impossible, I, I dare to say that it is impossible to encompass all of the different use cases or edge cases within three basic laws that you can hard code into a computer. Yeah, that's right. So lots of his works are about this, what you call edge cases or frictional cases in which the laws do not, uh, do not work together. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a conflict. So um, in principle, the ranking between the laws should give you an easy way out. But Asimov shows a multiple set of times in which um, these laws do not work work well. And so, you know, one example is uh, under the, the principles, you could not instruct a robot to, to put poison in a glass and give that to a human. Uh, so the robot would be instructed, so it would do it under law number two, but putting the poison in the glass, it would know that it's breaching Rule number one, which is do not harm a human. So it, that would not happen in this scenario. Then, you know, you can think about a scenario in which you have not one robot, but two robots, where the first robot is instructed to put the poison in the glass. And then the second robot is instructed to take the glass and give it to a human. In this case, you have a break in the chain of events, which lead to the possibility that the robots obeying human commands end up harming humans. Right. So mm -hmm. you, you have this. So Asimov came up with all these scenarios in which it was very easy to see the laws fail. And in some of his works, he actually tried to rework the laws to add some language, to tweak them a little. He even added a law on top of the, the of laws one to three, which was about do not harm humanity, the zero law. But even then, um, it didn't it never really worked well. So. It's it's just uh, fascinating that these frictional cases or these edge cases that you mentioned, um, you never can really figure out from the outset what they will be and how to solve them. Well, and now as you look at and hear about, I'm sure, artificial intelligence being used by the armies or by different military and it's being used to harm it's in direct conflict of that yes this is a very problematic use use case people say in the in the in the technology and business community and uh, I think there is a clear need that's my personal opinion for um, a ban or a moratorium on lethal autonomous weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, society has a claim in 
as a claimant, a lot of legitimacy in saying that there are some low risk but high impact scenarios in which we just don't want to use technology. Um, and um, and this is this is one of these areas, but it's very hard to it's very hard to align the interests of sovereign nations around this agenda. Um, some nations have very very well entrenched um, defense industry, mm-hmm. so it's it's really hard. Um, but I mean, personally and professionally, I've been sticking my neck out, saying that we need to do more and. Um, and be more prohibitive um, on these applications. Yeah, it feels like that is a no-brainer. That should be something that we need to get right now because the potential downside of this is great. And to not be able to see that seems a little ridiculous to me. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, the only scenario in which I would believe that we might need these weapons is where there would be a threat of extraterrestrial invasion by a super powerful uh, alien species that we've not uh, discovered, right? But this is a very thin case on which you want to base um, you want to base um, legalization of these weapons, and certainly not one based on on real science. So again, you know, coming back to what we were saying before, uh, extraterrestrial SF is very low in, in, in empirically relevant scientific content. And, and, ter- and so, you know, these monster species coming from outside of the solar um, system, um, you know, and this would be the justification to build these AI weapons. I mean, I found that... Um, yeah, I found that uh, fun um, to think about, but uh, you're very weak in terms of intellectual power. Mm. So how do these things hold up? How is it that this is still happening? Is it because of, like you said, there is such a large amount of money going into defense systems with certain economies? Yeah, Um so it's a, it's a very hard problem to solve. There's a big collective action issue here, which is that if, you know, you, you, suffice is it that one nation state in the world decides to invest heavily in these weapons, yeah. um, you know, the risk exists that these weapons will be deployed one day to dominate other nations and their populations. And, and so... If you have one country cheating, well, then, of course, the traditional way to deal with that is to, so either you're good, you try to cooperate in te- in internationally and, you know, have an agreement and, but, you know, this is excluded by hypothesis here. So what you want to do is oppose some dissuasion and develop your own weapon system, which is what um, nations did with, with nukes. And so that leads to this thing where this very bad equilibrium and cycle where, you know, one or two nations invest in this technology and others say we don't want to be left behind because we need to protect our population and hence we develop these weapons. But the problem, of course, with AI weapons is that there is this autonomy thing, which which is very scary, which is, you know, these are not conventional weapons. They might, um, they might do things which we don't understand. Uh, they might be super powerful. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's it happens because of opportunistic behavior or moral hazard with certain countries, the defense industry, the military, very powerful in some countries, and that creates this bad cycle of behavior in international affairs. So I want to switch gears real fast because you mentioned the explainability aspect of being able to understand artificial intelligence and why they made the choices that they made. And I wonder about at the rate of which we're creating artificial intelligence and when we're making these breakthroughs. And sometimes we don't understand why 
the machine learning models or the artificial intelligence acted the way it acted. Do you feel like that is a significant red flag to say, hey, we should slow down? Because if we can't understand, we need to put something in place so we don't advance any further and we make sure that we understand how we got to this point. Yes, so I, I'm completely in line with this idea. And the hard question is, for what types of applications, which, which, for, what, for what types of use cases and applications which do not have full explainability, do we decide to draw a line in terms of technology development and innovation and rolling out in, in society? And so, so you, because there's multiple, like a search engine might not be able, on the internet might not be able to give you an explanation. Wow. All right. Okay. We can live with that. Um, we don't really know how to explain flying, for instance, with airplanes. We know that there are a bunch of forces, but we can't, we do not have an exhaustive explanation of, of flying. Engineers are not able to produce a complete explanation of flying, even though they can explain most of it. But so, so there are areas in, in life where we tolerate imperfect explainability, and this should not be different from for AI. But I think they, so the, the hard question is, there, might, there, there are certainly areas in which we do not tolerate non-explainability or low explainability. And my, my personal view on that is certain areas create existential risk for people. And so some decisions which, which have existential potential on individuals and societies have to be subject to a higher explainability standard. So let me give you maybe two examples. The first one is the uh, issue of lethal autonomous weapons, where there is a clear existential risk, not only for individuals, but for societies, you know, with countries being wiped out by virtue of AI-led enabled uh, wars uh, in the future. So that's one. The second example is a decision to um, a decision to um, sentence someone to jail in a in a crime case should never be sub, should never be determined by use of a non-explainable AI system, right? Because you know you have clear existential life threatening and you know it doesn't need to be life sentence it can be two years but this is extremely disruptive in life so i think this this use cases and we need to think about a good criterion to define them but these are the areas in which where the impact on life is just higher than others then we need explainability yeah and as more and more use cases become obvious and we start having these different places where we're using AI, it is something that we need to really take a look at and say, is explainability a real core issue here? I think about the use case you talk about with the whether or not someone goes to jail. And one thing that I find really fascinating about the explainability issue is how deep do you go into explaining why the AI made the decision it did? Like, do you just give an overview of, because I think about um, when I'm on YouTube or, or one of the social media sites and you say, why am I seeing this? And then what you get is a very, very easy and stupefied reason for why you're seeing this. Well, people that have watched this video also liked this. Or people that are uh, males between the age of 25 and 35 have liked this or generally liked this. And that's not enough for me. But maybe that is enough for others. It seems to me like when we are talking about someone's life and these high stake use cases, you really need to go a lot deeper than that. 
And it's going to start being something where a judge is going to have to know and get really deep into the explainability if they want to use this technology. And so I fear in a way where we just outsource the decision to the AI. And then if we have some simple mode of explainability, that's good enough. That's right. So the problem here is um, there's not a template with a simple rule that could apply to all cases. And the hard question is, as the systems are very pervasive in societies and the use cases are infinite, we are going to have to come up with rules which are not too individualized because they will be impossible to practice, but that will be reasonably flexible and customized to to not entirely disable the the technology in the first place. So it's all a question of degree and it's not easy, but you know it, it forces us to think about what really matters and you know what's what is a what is a decision by a private sector organization or public administration that has life threatening consequences. So if I apply for, say, if I apply for a construction permit on my house, you know, it doesn't have a life-threatening impact on my, li- on my life. Now, if I apply for pension benefits or a child care al- allowance, this is a very different decision. So we should not treat them the same way in terms of the explainability requirements and and the specification of explainability and the degree of justification that I need to have. So I think public administrations and private sector organizations should be required to to and we we should help them to think about the various types of decisions that we are making and and correlate the degree of explainability to these types of decisions. That's a great point. The different degrees of how much this can be affecting one's life, we should also carry that same amount of degree of or standard for explainability in those different models. Excellent. So... I've got one last question for you and then we're going to wrap it up. I want to know <laughs> this one. Nicola, are you a robot? <laughs> you should ask my twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I doubt it because at the time where my mother gave birth, uh, robotic technology was was really nowhere. So, you know, if she's given birth to two. So the technology was pretty bad, but if she's managed to do, to do two, it, it is sure a sign that I'm not a robot. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on here and talking to me about all this stuff. I appreciate it. Have a great day. My pleasure. It was great to talk to you. See ya. See ya.